Hi, and welcome to Spaminar. This is Jim Guy. I'm the Properties Director at Milwaukee Repertory Theater and President of the Society of Property Art and Managers. I am, as we all must, experiencing technical difficulties, but you didn't actually come here to see me anyway, so I don't see why that should be a problem. This is our second in a series of online gatherings for live theater prop professionals and anyone interested in stage props. SPAM is an association of professional prop educators and prop managers from not-for-profit producing organizations with an international communications and support network that shares resources, information, solutions and techniques, safety issues, continuing education and stock. We promote the highest professional standards among prop artisans and craftspersons, as well as promote the profession of props to potential artisans and establish educational standards for the training of prop artisans. SPAM was formed in 1994 to create a fellowship among properties professionals and to address issues of common importance and create parity with other production areas. We now have more than 150 active members reaching from Hawaii to Ireland and Canada to Florida. Starting with this seminar, we're requesting pay what you can donations to help support this programming and our annual grants for early career prop professionals. If you can afford to donate, the link will be in the chat during the session and we truly appreciate any help you can give. Tonight's presentation is Bloody Hell, A Variety of Ways to Execute Blood Special Effects. And fun fact, it comes with our very first trigger warning. This class will contain simulated blood effects and injury effects. Our guest presenter is SPAM's very own Jen McClure, Yale Repertory Theater Prop Supervisor and Lecturer at the Yale School of Drama, where she's worked for 13 years. Over the span of her career, Jen has served as technical director, props master, and prop and set designer, and freelance prop artisans for a number of highly respected professional producing organizations and educational institutions. Our moderator is Stephanie Hansen, SPAM member, associate professor of theater and property supervisor, and resident scenic designer for the resident ensemble players at University of Delaware. At the end of the presentation, we'll have a short Q&A session. So write your questions in the chat field and Stephanie will select a few questions from the chat to ask. Be sure to stay tuned to the end of our session to hear about the great lineup of future SPAM and our guests and all the other ways you can interact with and learn from our membership. Okay, enough of that, on to the main event. I am pleased and proud to present my friends and colleagues, moderator Stephanie Hansen, and presenter Jen McClure. Enjoy. Wonderful. Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, like everybody said, I'm Jen McClure here from the Yale Rep. Um, so we've got a lot of stuff to cover tonight. Um, I've done a lot of blood effects while I've been here. Um, somehow I get wrangled into uh, working on a lot of the blood stuff that we do here between the Yale Rep productions and the student productions. Um, and so I've got a lot of information uh, and not a lot of time to give it. So we're gonna talk mainly tonight about blood delivery devices. There's a lot of information that you can get on the internet um, and in lots of different sources uh, about actual bloods that you can purchase or bloods that you can make. Um, a couple of our members, have, uh, Larry Heyman specifically, has a great director uh, article on Stage Directions magazine that we'll link to in the show notes. Um, but also look next year, uh, at about the end of next year, for the book that I'm writing about blood effects that's gonna cover the whole gamut of budgeting to making your own recipe to executing your effects, to cleaning everything up. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, first off, just a little bit about my setup here that I've got. Um, I've got some freezer paper down on my table so that if I spill anything, I'm able to wipe it up easily. I've got gloves because I'm probably gonna spill something on my hands and I don't want uh, to look like a total mess by the end of the night. Um, I've got a couple buckets of water down on the floor with some sponges and that kind of thing in them. Um, and I've got plastic all over the floor and also uh, a drop cloth on the wall and all behind me. So I've taken some good precautions of uh, in case anything splashes or any of that kind of stuff just to make sure that I can easily clean this up because this work can definitely be messy. Um, so let's start talking just about small effects first. So 
um, small things. You've probably all seen these little blood capsule kits that you can buy um, that have these little uh, capsules in them. You can also get these from vitamin suppliers and you can get empty ones so that you can fill them yourself. These come in different sizes and uh, the higher the number, the smaller the size. So a number five is a really small pill. This is a triple zero. Still not even that big, but this is the, one of the biggest sizes that you can get. And typically these are made from gelatin, but if you have any actors that are vegan and don't want to eat any animal products, you might want to investigate getting vegetable-based ones of these, um, which is what I have here. If you do this kind of work a lot, I would just say just have the vegetable ones on, on hand, and that way no matter who's eating it, you know that it's safe. So to fill these, you just take them apart. They come into two parts. There's a big part and a little part. Um, I put my stage blood, I'm just using one of my commercial products, like what I've got kind of back here. Um, but I like to put this in a little squeeze bottle. That way I'm not trying to pour into this tiny little thing. And this little uh, squeeze bottle gives me a nice precise application. Also this little twisty top means that I never lose the lid. Uh, I had some of these that had a little pop on lid and inevitably you, use the, you lose the lid. So these twisty lids are really great. So I'm just gonna fill this up. And I wanna fill this so that it's kind of filled and I kind of put one extra little drop on top of there. So you can kind of see, if I hold it up over here, there's a little bit of a bubble over top the top of that. Now I'm gonna take my other side, the empty side, and just put that over top of here and close that up. What that little bubble at the top does is tries to not let to have much air in the top, but inevitably you're gonna get a little bit of air in the top. I wouldn't recommend trying to fill the other side and put them together because you're probably gonna then just dump them one into each other and then just get a big mess. So not ideal. So here we've got a nice little filled capsule. So that would be ready to go. These you can fill ahead of time. Um, and even though the capsules uh, break down with liquid, they don't break down that quickly. Your stomach enzymes will break them down a lot faster than just typical water will. So you can make these a couple days in advance or even make a week's worth of, of capsules and have them ready to go. Okay, so next we're going to make just some little blood bags. So these affectionately are often called strawberries or chicken hearts and I'm just here using super cheap plastic bags. I actually don't want the good brand name Ziploc bags because they're too good. The plastic is too strong and they don't break when you try to smack them on yourself or smack them in between your hands or bite into them and break them in your mouth. So I want the cheapest bread bags possible. So I usually get them from the dollar store or if I'm going to a big box store, I try to get the generic brand. So I'm gonna take my little bag here. I'm gonna make a little cup with my hand and then I'm gonna take the corner of this and just put it in my little cup and spread the rest of this bag kind of over my hand. And then I'm just gonna fill inside of there a little bit of blood. Squeeze that up. And I'm gonna to try to gather as much air out of this. I want this to be as much blood as possible and not a lot of air because I want it to give as much bang for its buck. Now I could just tie a knot in this and be totally good to go. I find that when I do that though, I have a hard time getting this really, really nice and tight. And also um, I wind up getting a lot of air in it. So I'm gonna show you another way to close these. I like to use some thread. So this is just some red thread. And I hold the end of the thread in my, end, uh, in my hand holding the bag. And then I just kind of start to walk the thread down. And I'm gonna squeeze all the air out. And then I just kind of start moving the bag down. And you can see how, as I get closer and closer, this gets tighter and tighter. So if I try to squeeze this, it's really, really tight now. So once it's nice and taut, then I'm gonna wrap around just like 10 times. And I'm not even gonna tie a knot in this. I can just snip this off right at the top. And now I've got this great little bag. So let's go over to my little detail camera over here. Here's this little bag. So you can see it's just where I cut off right up here, but I can squeeze this and it's not busting open. But what's nice is that because there's no uh, tie and there's no knot in the top of this, that 
if I were to squeeze this or punch this against somebody or bite into this, either the plastic is going to break or this is going to give way because it doesn't have a knot in it. So that's actually going to make this more reliable to break. So that's pretty nice about this. And then you can see kind of why it's called a little strawberry, because that's kind of what shape it becomes. So that's pretty easy. Those are nice to be able to just make really quickly if you have to do some testing with your actor. Uh, you can have just a bag uh, and some scissors on set and be able to make those super, super fast. So another way to make nice, small, individual size bags is with an impulse sealer. This is one of my favorite tools for using with blood stuff. Um, this has a heating element that runs up and down here. And when I press this, you're going to see a little red light come on. And that red light just goes on for how long um, this little dial is set for. So there's not a temperature gauge for this. It's only on for how long this dial is set for. So if I turn it all the way down to one, the light only comes on real fast. If I turn it up really high, the light stays on for a while. But then I could press this down all day long and it wouldn't get hot anymore. So that's a really nice safety feature about this is that it doesn't stay on. It's only on for as long as this dial sets it for. Now I know that with my little bags here that about middle of the road four and a half is a, is a good heat to do this. But if you're using a new plastic or if you're new to using a heat sealer, you might need to do some tests and just make sure that you're using the right setting. If it's too hot, you're going to melt the bag and it's going to get all stringy. If it's not hot enough, it's not going to make you a good enough seal and then your bag's going to leak. Okay, so we're going to make some little custom size bags. So again, I'm just using my super cheap plastic bags here. And I'm going to reinforce this edge, the factory edge that this comes on. So this is a four inch heat sealer. You can get these in four inch, you can get these in eight inch. There'll be links to these in the show notes. Um, but this is a great size because it's almost just the size of the bag that I need. So if I do this and press this down, see if this went on and off, I hold it for an extra second and then I get a nice little seal. So I'll come over here to show what this looks like. So you can kind of see, uh, it's a little hard to tell, but there's a little, line right there. There's a little hazy line and that's what's actually the sealed heat brief. Okay, so I'm going to basically make some channels in here. You can even see it on the front view a little bit better, that extra little line on the bag. That's my heat sealer line. So I'm basically going to create a little reservoir for my blood and then I'm going to make a little channel to cut these apart and then another reservoir for the blood and then another channel. I don't want to try to cut this right along um, this line because it's not that thick. And if I made a whole bunch of channels next to each other and tried to precisely cut up this, I very likely would uh, cut this and the seal wouldn't be as complete and then they might leak. So I'm going to really quickly just make a big channel and then a little channel. Big and little. So now you can kind of see that I've got a blood channel, a cut, a blood channel, and a cut. I could, if I had a longer heat sealer, make a whole bunch of these and then fill them all with blood and do six bags all at once if I wanted to. So when you're trying to streamline this and, and make a whole bunch, you can do that. But I'm just gonna cut these apart. And then we're just gonna fill this up. Again, these squeeze bottles, super great. Really helpful for getting this inside of here. If you're trying to do this with a funnel, it can get real messy. So I'm just gonna fill this with a little bit of this blood. I got a little out of the way. Let me grab my sponge. So now I'm just going to drape this over the side of the heat sealer here and kind of press out any air bubbles. And then I'm going to heat seal this down. And it's okay that there is a little bit of blood on the other side of this. The heat sealer can go through the liquid and that's totally fine. But so right now, this, is, this isn't very tight. I can kind of squeeze this and I can almost squeeze my fingers together. So I want this blood bag to be really, really tight. 
because I want it to be that when you squeeze it, it almost breaks. Well, it does break, and I want it to, to be like right at the, at the verge of breaking. So I'm gonna just kind of put this in here and wiggle it a little bit closer and seal it again. And I'm kind of trying to creep up on where that tight level is. If I do it too tight, then my seal might actually leak because like what just happened there is this uh, got too strong and melted or, or it was too heavy and it melted off of there, but this might still be okay. So now I've got this lovely little bag that even when I squeeze it, it's totally good, okay? I like to keep a, a cup of water handy when I'm doing these because just in case these leak, I can stick them in there, but inevitably my hands are gonna get sticky. I'm gonna get sticky from this all over the place. So I like to just stick them straight in a cup of water and just in case they leak, then they leak in that water. They don't leak all over your table. So that's really helpful. All right, so I'm gonna just make another one of these that's kind of big and small so that you can see how you can do two at a time. And when we're doing stuff like this for rehearsals or we're trying to kind of figure these effects out, we'll often do these with water and make a whole bunch of different sizes so that the actors can um, figure out what size fits best in their hand or if we're putting them in someone's mouth, what size is the best and also what kind of um, gives us the most quantity of liquid that we're working with. But you can do all of that with water so that you don't make such a mess if you're just using blood. Okay, so we're gonna do another one. And this one, I'm gonna kind of seal a little bit higher. And I'm gonna show you how, so this one's got a lot of flex in it. I can really squeeze my fingers together. So I'm actually gonna take this big bag and drape it completely in half over the heat sealer. And I'm gonna seal it straight in the middle so that I can make two bags. Now, like I said, if I tried to cut on that line, that's a little too, uh, too small to cut on and I would probably make one of them leak. So I'm gonna move over just a little bit and try to seal this other bag just a little tighter so that now I've got just a little more space in there and I can cut these in half. But you can see how you could quickly, if you were trying to make a bunch, you could make long channels as well and get two really quick. So these are really nice for, uh, you could make bigger sizes of these, but these are a really great size for kind of hiding in someone's palm, in their hand. You can even put um, these or maybe a little smaller in someone's mouth. Now a little bit of a disclaimer, if you're ever putting stuff like this in someone's mouth, you really want to work with your fight choreographer to work out that moment and work with the actor to make sure they're comfortable with that. You want to have a plan for what happens to this plastic after someone bites it. We never do work like this or we never put things like this in someone's mouth if they're doing really aggressive fight choreography where they're running around and breathing really deeply because there's too much of a chance that they might break this and then swallow the bag. So we only use these kind of things in someone's mouth in controlled um, fight work and then have a plan with the actor whether they tuck the plastic bag sort of in the pocket of their cheek or maybe they spit it out in their hands and then drop it and it just kind of looks like part of the blood. Um, but if you're ever putting something like this as opposed to our blood capsules in someone's mouth, be sure to work that out with your fight director. Also be sure that the blood that you choose is completely edible and uh, make sure that you check if you're using a commercial product that there's no soap or anything in it. I, if I'm ever putting anything in someone's mouth, typically will use a recipe that I have made because I know that it's completely made of foodstuffs. Um, some of the, the products say that they're non-toxic, but it doesn't mean that you can swallow it. So uh, just in case someone swallows any, any bit of that, I always make things for people's mouth out of something completely edible. All right, so we've got a couple of those. And here's our strawberry. We're gonna stick that in our cup too. Um, all right, so now we're gonna move on to small bottles and containers. Let's leave this out. So there's a huge range of little bottles and things that you can store your blood in. You can get little bottles like this that have squeezy ends the, at craft stores. You can get um, open ones of these or you can even buy these with like 
glitter glue or eye drops or something and just empty them out, but you can also buy empty ones of these. So here's a longer one, here's one of these. Um, you can get these great aspirators. These are available in a couple different places, usually either at your, um, in, in, at your pharmacy store or in the pharmacy section of sort of your grocery store or your big box store. And they can be found in three places. One is the baby section, two is sort of the ear or nose uh, healthcare section, and then three is the enema section. So there are different sizes that you can find. So I would say check out all of those sections because sometimes there's different products that you can get uh, in different sizes and shapes uh, in different parts of the, the store. But these are really wonderful, especially this size, because this is really kind of the size of a palm. And uh, you can kind of, of course, my gloves are blue and this is blue, but you can really hide this down kind of your pointer finger really easily. Um, and from an audience be able to really squirt and apply blood to someone with one of these and not even have to have it be in a bag. You can uh, do your fight choreography to just pick one of these up and either the person who is injured or the person who's causing the harm to someone can use this to apply blood. So those are pretty great. There's also these nice silicone travel bottles that are really squeezy. Um, they're really nice because they can fit well in a pocket. And what's nice about these is, let's come over to the detail camera. These have a great little end. You can kind of see as I, as I uh, puff it open that there's a little like star shaped seal in there. But it's kind of like what's on a mustard container too, where that little seal really helps these to not leak. So you can put this in someone's pocket and until they actually squeeze it, um, you don't need a cap or a, any other fitter, container on this. So these come in a couple different sizes. They're really nice. Um, there's plenty of syringes that you can apply blood with. Um, these are kind of great if you're trying to get a really controlled effect and every time you want to apply exactly the same amount of blood. They also have a nice precision tip so you can apply that really precisely and in the same uh, place or in a, in a really either thin line or really precise area. So that's pretty nice. These also, with a little bit of practice, you can fill them and like jam them really fast and be able to get a little bit of a squirt or uh, something up either on a wall or a window or something from backstage. So you can get a little bit of projectile from these as well. They come in plenty of different sizes. This is, a, uh, I think, a 10 milliliter. This is two ounces. So you can get all kinds of different sizes of these syringes. There, these are little pipettes that you can get sort of used often for uh, science experiments, but these are kind of nice. They have a little reservoir already built in. And so these kind of things are great because you can do kind of what I've done here. This is just a knife that I've rigged to be a blood knife, but I've taken some foil tape and just taped a little tube on the back of here. And then I've just got my, uh, my bottle literally taped here behind the handle, but I'm gonna just wrap this real quick with some electrical tape and you'll see how easy it goes away. It's really kind of ridiculous um, how we hide these things sometimes. And a lot of it is using a lot of uh, magic trick and, uh, and illusion theory where you're really just kind of misdirecting folks um, with the fight choreography. And sometimes we'll have used another knife in, in a scene earlier that actually cuts and then this one, because it's nice and shiny on the front, then reads as the regular knife. And even if you see the back by accident, the silver tape hides the, hides the tube. But because the handle's already black, if this is in someone's hand, you're not even seeing that bottle, which is really nice. So if this just kind of gets flashed around, and then that can be used to dispense your blood. So that's pretty nice. These bottles are also really great because you can clean them out easily. You can take this little tip off and get in there to clean them out. These are kind of trickier to clean because they don't open up in the back. Um, so you have to really like squeeze them in and out with soapy water and jostle them around a lot to make sure that you've got all the blood out of there. If you're using some sort of blood that's corn syrup based or something food based in one of these and you don't get it all out, then it can get moldy inside. So if you're not sure about how these were used before, it's better to just buy a new one. They're like less than $10, so they're really economical to just get new ones if you're not sure about them. Or if you just need new ones to be able to make a new stock at the theater that you're working at. Okay, uh, that's those ones. So next we've got some bigger blood reservoirs. So the medical 
uh, field has a lot of different things that we like to use. Um, these are a whole bunch of different type of leg drainage bags um, for when folks have operations and have a drainage port put in. But what's nice about these is that these are really ruggedly made and really nice and solid. So these are the kind of bags that we don't want them to break. They've got ports on them to dispense our, our liquid, um, but the seals on them are really good and the plastic is really high quality. So this is for when we want to have a nice uh, a secure reservoir that we hope won't leak these are really good to, to go with. These come in lots of different sizes. So this is a, a 19 ounce. I think I've got, this is a 32 ounce. And so these have different, often have different sort of ports. Here's one that's got a little just um, twist knob for the, for the port. And they typically have a fill port at the top. You can see there's a little bit of extra plastic in here. And what that is, is sort of two pieces of plastic that when you put blood in, it stops uh, and seals closed so that the blood can't come out that way. So then it can only come out this way. So then you would need to just turn this knob to dispense your blood. I really like these ones that have these little flip tops because this is a really secure and easy uh, way to make sure that you're, that you're open or closed is whether or not this is open or closed. These also typically come with or often come with um, some sort of little holes in them to affix either an elastic or uh, a way to kind of hold it to your body, which can be really helpful because then when we are trying to affix this to someone's leg or their body, we've already got built in things into this if we don't want to build an extra bag. I'm going to show you some bags that our costume folks help us with, with these too, but it's really nice that these already have these hangers on them. So that's a couple of these. Um, what we'll often do as well is when we have this little fill port, we'll use these little things I'm sure everybody has seen and has a plethora of just an earplug. Once we fill it, we'll often just stick a little earplug in the top of there just to make sure no extra drips from when we filled this come out by accident. So these are some bags like that. Um, I don't like IV bags. I've got a couple just to show sort of what the difference are is, but the ports on these aren't as easy to hook up hoses to and uh, they, they don't open and close the same way and they don't have a, a, as easy of a fill. So I don't like these as much. I like the ones that have one end is in, one end is out so you don't get them confused. Um, but you can use these too. So IV bags exist as well. But if you're searching for stuff like this, you want to look for leg drainage bags. That's what these are. We're going to put some lists or some links to these also in the show notes. <clears throat> you can also, with the heat sealer, modify the size of these. So here's a couple that we've actually cut kind of in half for when we needed a really specific size of blood, um, that we wanted a stronger reservoir, that we didn't want a breakable bag, but we wanted to use this, but just smaller so that we didn't have a big bag to deal with. So you can also do that, which is nice. When you're sealing through this thicker plastic, you usually have to turn the heat sealer up a little bit more. Um, so you just have to test to see what's strong enough to get through those, but that's really great. So then typically with this kind of thing, you're using some sort of tubing. So there's latex tubing, which is often sort of yellow um, or a little orangey, and then non-latex tubing. I have mine in two separate bags because some folks have latex allergies. So before you use latex um, tubing or any kind of thing with an actor, you need to double check that your performer doesn't have a latex sensitivity or allergy. And if they do, you want to make sure that the tubing you use is non-latex. So that's why I keep mine in two separate bags so there's no cross-contamination. Um, and I just make sure to double check that. Latex tubing is great because it's super flexible, but also when you try to do turns or try to get around a, a maybe a, a shoulder joint or something, it can also kink kind of easily. So that can be a little bit of a detriment is that you want to be sure that you're not taking too hard corners with your latex hose because it might actually stop your blood flow. All right, so then I've got one of these that we're kind of going to look at the setup from my friend here. Okay, so I've got some hosing. I've got a bag. So this is a blood bag that I filled earlier. I kind of just folded it in half because I don't need the whole thing. And here's just a nice little holster that our costume department had, had rigged up for us for another show. So this was one that kind of went 
uh, over the shoulders and then went around the body and belt prone. And so this is just kind of showing that there's different ways to be able to securely hold your blood reservoir. So then I would just tuck this into here. I'm gonna show kind of how we would rig this up on the outside and then later on I'm gonna put this all on the inside so we can actually squirt this guy. But if we were to put this blood in here, then I'm gonna to need to attach tubing to it. So what I really like actually about the latex tubing is that I can put it on one of these valves and just kind of press it on. And because it's so stretchy, then if I pull this, it doesn't come off, um, which is really nice. The other tubes that have less stretch than that, if you put them on, there's more of a chance they fit kind of tight, but then they can pop off easily. So you would want to either use a hose clamp or something to keep this type of hose on, but latex tube, because it stretches, really goes on there and then you can give it a tug and it's pretty secure. So that's really nice. So depending on where you would want to dispense this blood, you could either have your blood bag where the, the point is up. And this is kind of nice because then um, no matter what, you're not, until you actually press and squeeze on this, blood's not coming out. If you put the valve down, which you might have to do because you might either have blood in the lower part of someone um, or just because of how big the bag is, then there's a chance that it could leak or uh, if the valve is open, it could sort of dispense ahead of time. So I like to try to put my valve up if possible. And then uh, have you can have your tube kind of come to wherever you want your, your blood to go. So if I were to put this up and undo this, I could have uh, you know, fight, fight choreography be going on. And as long as whatever happened in here, you can kind of see that blood traveling, but the blood has to travel up and over this little crest to come out. So if I were to put this straight down, then I have less sort of wiggle room in how that far that goes. So the length of tube that you use and the, the path that you go kind of can depend on what the fight choreography is and where you want this to be placed. But don't forget the amount of tube that you have here. You also have to account in your reservoir for you need liquid to get through the tube and then you need liquid to come out. So sometimes if you've got a really long travel path, you need to have a longer reservoir. Even though you only want a little bit of blood over here, it's got to travel all this way and you're going to have a bunch of stuff left in your tube. So remember that you might need to have a bigger reservoir if you're going really far. If you're doing a whole bunch of fight choreography and you want to make sure that this doesn't uh, activate before the end death or whatever it might be, you can also put a little loop in this and then have it going where you go. So the press on this would have to get all the way through this little loop to loop before it dispenses. So that can also be a little bit of another safety factor to be able before this gets dispensed. One other thing that I've done to the end of this tube is I've just sewn a little uh, I've sewn a little stitch in the end of it. So that basically, the end of my tube is two little openings, one at the top and then one at the bottom, instead of just one big opening like this. That means that when the blood comes out, it's gonna try to squirt in kind of two different directions and give me a more natural spread as opposed to just gushing out of this giant, giant hose and looking you know, like a fire hydrant, which we don't want. Okay. So that's some of those. So now let's talk about air effects. Our friend here is gonna come back out and help us in a little bit. Okay, so now we've got some air assisted effects. Let's get rid of some of these effects. So most of the things that I'm talking about are for theater or live events. In movies, a lot of times they use actual explosions to make gunshots and uh, they're called squibs and they usually have an actual little bit of explosive in there. To be able to use those, you need someone who actually has a pyrotechnic license, which often um, in theaters that we're working in, we're trying to you know, save money and a lot of people don't have that person. So uh, also there's a lot of risk of uh, those things going wrong and injuring someone if someone isn't experienced enough. So uh, I don't like to use them at all, but there are a few air assisted things that, that we can look at. 
So this is a product that I got a bunch of years ago. There, I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes, but I don't know if the comp this company makes this anymore. But it's basically just a little, essentially a squirt bottle with an, a little adapter that they fit in. But it's got a little piece of brass in the end of this. And let's uh, come over to detail show this. So it's got this little piece of machined brass here. It's got these little slots. And so when I pump water through this, it's gonna squirt to the sides, but the top is capped. So it doesn't come out the top, it comes out the sides and basically makes like a little artery uh, uh, spray, which is what's kind of nice about this. Now, I don't know that this company is making this um, little piece of brass anymore, but if you had machining capabilities, you could make this or folks with 3D printer capabilities could easily also make a little end valve like this. You could probably make something exactly like this by just taking a piece of hose or tubing, putting a little bit of hot glue or epoxy in the end of your tube, and then just cutting some slits in it. You could get this exact same little thing. Or kind of the same thing that I just showed you with the rubber tube as well. You could just uh, pinch the end of the rubber tube and then cut some slits in it too. So this little thing we're gonna squirt on the wall later, but this is literally just put it in any sort of reservoir and just pump it and it squirts out. They also make this for assisting with things that look like gunshots. So this is just a tubing that comes up and forces all of the blood forward. So it's got a little capsule, it's got like a little reservoir in here, but out of the hose, everything would come up and squirt. So I could use that kind of thing with this hand pump or with a, a pressurized pump sprayer, sort of like a Hudson sprayer, like our scenic painter friends use. Um, this tubing is a little flexible, so I'd be careful with using this with an air pressure uh, thing, but you can use, just take this off and use this with um, stronger pneumatic hose as well. So the Roger George company, which we'll link to, still makes these little things and still sells these. So they call this sort of a squib assist. What's nice is that it's got some little holes in the corner. So you could sew this into, or have in the corner, oh look at my blood, um, you could have this you know, sewn into a shirt and, and uh, be sewn into an undershirt or some sort of harness so that this stays put and really is where you want it. All right, and so then this is one of my favorites. This is basically uh, for filling up bike tires. So this is a little CO2 canister. Um, here's a little spare one. So you get these little CO2 canisters. I think this is 16 grams. And they sell these again just to repair your bike tires. Um, but what's nice is that you can get a little um, barbed end, like I put here, and then you can attach a hose to this. Now I've got a hose clamp on this because since this is going to be high pressure, I want to make sure this doesn't fly off. You could zip tie this to the end, but I would really do something more mechanical, which is, which is better. Um, but so basically to fill this, we're just going to put some blood inside of this tube and then just blast this, which I'll show you before we put the blood in, but you can kind of hear that it makes just some CO2 air come out. So we're gonna just fill up this little tube and just blast it. And this is really great for a gunshot or that kind of thing. You can have this hidden either behind someone's back or even on a chair or under a table um, and, and activate it that way. And it doesn't even have to be on a person. But these are nice because there's no, there's no uh, refilling of the compressed air, there's no batteries. Um, they make a really big effect for not a lot of space. This one in particular is also really nice because this cover um, protects the canister. And I like that the trigger is on the inside here. Some of them have a trigger on the outside and I worry that that's a little too easy to bump into by accident. So the fact that the trigger is kind of in line with the, with the hosing means that you really have to deliberately reach in there and grab it to make sure to fire this thing. Also, the canisters get a little cold when you spray them. So some of these, you can get bigger canisters, but this one has this nice little housing, so it sort of protects your hands or whoever's firing it from how cold this gets if someone actually had to hold this. Um, all right, so that's kind of my big, my big stuff. So now we're gonna start making a mess. That's, I'm sure, why you all uh, are here. So let's start actually looking at what some of these things do. Let's bring my friend back. Okay, and you already had a little bit of blood start to come out of there. So I'm going to take this out and show you. I've got this little pocket that I've made. This is how we kind of contain when we put blood bags in costumes. 
Um, this is made from a piece of vinyl in the back and then just a little piece of screen in the front. So I'm going to take one of my little bags that I made earlier and just stick it in there. So this is nice because it kind of holds this in place in a costume. And then when I break this, the plastic on the back is going to force the blood forward so that more of it has more chance to actually come out of the clothing than it would to just drip down the performer's skin. So anytime that you can apply blood on the outside of clothes, way easier than trying to soak through something. But we're going to look at um, a couple different options. I'm going to load this guy up. Let's put this kind of right center stage here, and I'm just going to break this. So, so there's my little blood from my bag. Now this gave me a little bit of a dead zone where my bag was and kind of came up and down uh, from where the actual bag was. So you just want to, you know, in some testing, kind of figure out what this does and how big of a um, size you needed, and maybe you would want to hit on one side or the other. But that came out pretty good that it actually bled through this shirt. This is just a cotton shirt. Um, here's kind of the same thing from the outside. So I'm just going to take this bag and kind of come over here and just in my hand hit. Oh, and I got it all in my face. Great. Um, so that's on the outside. So what happens here nicely is that we actually got a really nice strip down the front. So that's giving us some great stuff there. So that's kind of the difference between having to soak through a costume whereas this feels a lot more wet than coming through. Let's see if I can get a little off the table. All right, job has it. Okay, so then let's look real fast at uh, our little blood bag here. Where's that good scoop? Okay, let's close this. So we're gonna under these clothes, come up and see my friend. And we're going to just Velcro this kind of around his chest. And then I'm going to add this to So and while you're hooking that up, I'm going to yeah. give you the five minute warning. Great, we're thank you. Yeah, we're almost done. So I'm going to just put this under here and come back down to here. Now, this would be for maybe like somebody needing to bleed out of their stomach. So you would attach this little hose somewhere that you knew could be um, activated. Oh, wait, and I didn't open my thing. Let's open this back up. And then your actor could just press this and be able, you might not have enough blood there. Hold on, we're going to cut this. So I had too much travel hose, which is what happened. So you can just press this bag and then get your blood to erupt. And then you can get a nice amount of stuff that sort of slowly comes out. Now, again, you can have this tube like go through a sleeve or that kind of thing and actually have it kind of just squirt on someone's hand and then they could smear it all over the front of them, which would also uh, give you a nice look here. Okay, so let's just real quick look at some of our squirts. So here's our artery pump. So we're just gonna spray this on this wall behind me. So I've got this super liquidy blood I'm going to put down here and you'll be able to see this is kind of going to go you know, kind of see it coming up the tube and here we go and so you can see that it's kind of giving me a little bit of pulsing squirt and as it hits the wall it gives some nice little drips there okay and then last is our favorite the CO2. So I'm going to fill this with my little squirt bottle. Get this real careful so you don't get a lot of air in there. Got a little 
bubble. So let's give it a sec. Keep going. A little bubble. Just want to get a little more. This is the problem with using the skinny hose. So it gets hard to fill. And see, what did I tell you that I was going to get covered in blood? That's why I wore gloves. And why I'm wearing black. <laughs> because that hides all of the blood splatter. Okay, so we got a little bit here in this tube. We're going to see what this does. So this definitely requires some testing uh, about how many times you can do this pulse. These, uh, depending on how big of a container you have, then that sort of depends on how um, much spray you get and how long it goes. So we're just going to do some quick little pulses and see what we kind of get. Oh, yeah. So that can give a really nice, if this whole tube was full, that would give a really nice blast really fast. And just to kind of show you an example, here's how long this, this was a brand new one of these. Here's how long this lasts. Is now that's empty. So not long. So again, um, depending on uh, depending on what your effect is looking like. But this is really cold, and this tube is really cold. So you want to be really careful if you're putting this up against someone's body to not uh, to to have some padding, or preferably to not actually have this hose and this kind of thing attached to someone uh, without some padding. Um, so that's what I got for small delivery devices. So there's so much more to share and so much more to say about blood, but that's kind of what we can uh, show in, in just this little bit of time and then be able to take some questions. So I'm sure there's questions. So uh, let, let's see what you guys got. Hey, right. thank you so much. Um, yeah. So our first question has to deal with specifically those uh, cheap bags and the heat sealing. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the corners are generally the, the weak spot, and it, it basically, is there a way that you can kind of reliably create the explosion point of those blood bags? Um, it's not so much with those kind of things. It's often more about um, practicing with your actor about how they hold them. So here's kind of my little strawberry, right? And so this kind of fits really well in, in my hand, but um, it's just a little big. You can kind of see it's peeking out a little bit there. So if I were to squeeze this, it might come out here, but it also might come out here. So this is why we do lots of practice with the actors um, to try to figure out like where they need to kind of close their hand and how big this should be. Now, if I use this little one, I can really reliably get my hand really, really close around this. And let's see if I'm gonna lie to you or not. I can squeeze this and actually not have it squirt out up here or in here and it just came out the bottom because it completely opened my hand. If I were to do this one, it would shoot up into the sky and out here because it's too big for my hand. So there's a little bit of dialing in with your performer how big, if you're doing it into their hand, how, how big that is. But um, you know, with these, they're, they're a little bit better used for either in a pocket where you can just do a splat or when you just have it kind of in a hand to do a splat and where you just kind of need to make a big mess, they're not as good for a direct application. If you wanted something really nice and, and direct, I would recommend using um, an aspirator or something more like this because you can get a way better, um, just really quick line with just something like this. And you can run off or somebody can even have this in their hand and you can get a way better application with just a little squirt bottle. Okay. Um, the next question is about the, the primarily the medical bags that you've been using. Uh -huh. do, you, do you clean them out and reuse them or do you consider them disposable? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I will use them for, it sort of depends on what the blood recipe is and also uh, how long the run is. If the blood recipe is something food based, I usually try to use them for maybe a week and then get rid of them. You can clean them um, because you can run water sort of through the top vent and open up the bottom port and try to run water through them. But inevitably, there's always still a little bit of water inside and it's hard to dry them out. You can take a couple drops of alcohol, like once you get it pretty darn close to being dry, you can put a couple drops of alcohol in there and that'll help dry up the last little bits 
of water, sort of like if you went swimming when you were a kid and you got water in your ears and then you drop some alcohol in there and it helps dry it up. Sort of the same, same idea. Um, but inevitably, you know, they start to kind of get mucky on the inside. So if you were doing a long run, I would plan on maybe using a bag. I think somewhat related to that was a question about where you get the bags from, mm -hmm. and how much economy gonna, you craft and where you get them. Yeah, we're going to put some links in the, in the show notes, but there's a ton of medical suppliers online. Um, you can just search leg drainage bags and find a ton of options. It's probably like medical, uh, you know, medicalsupply.com or everyone, you know, web, web medicalsupply.com. Um, there's a whole bunch. I found a link that we're going to, that we're going to include in the show notes that has a whole bunch of different sizes. Um, as well as different valve types in, in one website that we'll put to. But you don't have to rely on any of the specific links that I tell you. We're not sponsored by any of them. I just kind of looked for stuff that was comparable to what we were using here. Um, another question was in regards to where you're getting the blood. And you did reference making it too, but do you have any favorite sources or maybe that's something that will also be in the links? Um, yeah, we'll, we'll put some links. I, the couple brands that I really like that are, that are really reliable, um, Nick Dudman's uh, Pigs Might Fly Blood. This is like one of the best on the market, but it's also super expensive. Um, it is pretty thick, and so you can water it down a fair amount, so it can make your money go a little longer. But I mean, this um, quantity is maybe close to $75 or $100. Um, you know, it's, a, it's almost $400 a gallon. Um, they, they sell them by the liter, but when you when you uh, multiply it up, whereas like some of these other ones, this gallon is like a hundred dollars. That's still pretty pricey, but not four hundred dollars. You know, so this is Real Blood R E E L. It's another brand that's pretty good. Um, Gravity and Momentum is another brand that's wonderful. And then we're also going to link to uh, Larry Heyman's recipe that he developed last year that was in Stage Directions. Um, that's kind of a new edible recipe that's uh, really reliably washing out of a lot of things and is kind of one of the new favorite for when you're mixing your own. I think kind of related to that, there are several questions in regards to how long do you use water in the rehearsal process before switching to blood and then I guess judging how much blood you use in the rehearsal process versus performance. Yeah, um, it, it always starts with more. And then by the time you get into the actual show and the actors do it a few times, inevitably they will be like, this is too messy, I don't want to do it. So, um, which is kind of why we start with some water and then we're like, we're making a huge mess here. Um, typically what I try to do is, uh, we try to have at least one or two rehearsal days in the rehearsal room where we can go in, costumes will pull us some either spare clothes or scrubs and we'll put the actors in, in spare clothes. And we'll usually maybe try once or twice with water to see like where we want it and how much liquid is happening. And also to get people just used to like, if we're using a bag like this, what it takes to break that bag and kind of what that force is like. And then if they're ready, and, and we feel like we have a good idea from the director that it's where we want to go, we might even have blood versions of those things ready to go that day. If the design team isn't happy at that point and wants us to rework things, then we would come back uh, with some other options and, and rework some things. But typically, we have a conversation with the fight director about how we're kind of going to try to hide some things and where we think it's best. And uh, we try to show up to those rehearsals with a whole range of things to try so that we're maximizing our time with everyone. And we don't say, we just brought this one thing to try. We usually have some of these in water, some of these in blood. I'll even bring some of these just in case. And, uh, and we try to do that. But it is, a, it is a big mess. And so you also just need to make sure that you plan time for your actors to clean up. Um, you know, and then they might need to either go take a shower after that or that kind of thing. So you have to work that all out the stage management. All right. What, uh, another question is about how, what the uh, average shelf life of the bloods are and if the manufacturers actually tend to tell you. Yeah, um, some of them do. I mean, I've actually had some of these real blood ones hanging out for a few years and they're pretty stable. Um, the one that, that tends to have a weird funky shelf life is the gravity and momentum blood. Their, their blood is really great and it washes out of a lot of stuff, but it maybe after like three months starts to get a little bit green. I don't know if they stabilize that in their recipe yet, but if you're using that brand specifically, I wouldn't overbuy. Um, but most of the other ones have, have a pretty good shelf life. The Nick Dudman does have a, um, have a, a date on it that says best before March of 21. So this maybe is about a year and a half to two years 
um, that they, you know, sort of guarantee this for. But any of these commercial ones, I've never had them go moldy. I have had ones that I've mixed, even if they're in the fridge for too long to get moldy. Another question is regarding if you're using capsules with actors, if there are any tips that you have, if they need to have them in their mouths for a while. Um, they can have them in their mouth for a while and truthfully, like I said, until they actually hit your stomach acids, they don't really dissolve um, too much. It would be more about if they chewed on them and, and broke them. But I've had um, uh, capsules made that are full of liquid for months and they sit around I mean, they're not sitting in water, but they're full of liquid and they don't dissolve and fall apart. So you can put them in someone's mouth for a few minutes or something um, uh, ahead of time. I wouldn't do more than like five or 10 minutes maybe. But again, that's kind of gets worked out in, in rehearsal. You wanna try to, if you're putting blood in someone's mouth, try to do it as soon as, as close as the, when the effect has to happen so that they don't have to have it for too long. I think and our last question relates more to large quantities of blood and when you have to deal with that and if, if you have a, any other sourcing. Yeah, I, I have a ton of information about that, which again will be in, in my book that I'm putting out. Um, but that could be a whole another hour long thing about, about pools and, and sprays and that kind of thing. Um, the short answer is, uh, you know, try to consult someone who's done it before. If you've never done it, um, definitely talk to someone who's done it before and consider jobbing someone in to just do that. When you get into a big effect like that, it can take one person a month or two to figure that out, do all the testing and, and figure out all the little parts of that. Um, and it's a huge job. So if you're doing a show by yourself or with a small crew, you might not be able to have one person work on only that, but it takes up a lot of time. Um, and it shouldn't be something that you just throw in, uh, uh, you know, late in the game. You have to coordinate with scenery and everybody to have drains in the floor and, and all kinds of things when you get into really big quantities. Um, I guess one, one last late, we have time still, so one yeah. last here. Yeah. Um, the one question was about a base, your favorite base, if you make your own blood. Yeah, so um, most of them are, are some sort of corn syrup and other stuff. You can also do bases out of glycerin or methyl cellulose, which is kind of a slime type food thickener. Um, but uh, usually a lot of people start with corn syrup. Um, what's nice is that it's sticky and actually what's good about the sticky is that it, when you clean it, it doesn't make the stage super slippery. So glycerin and methyl cellulose can actually make the stage more slippery when you clean it up. So the stickiness of the corn syrup usually works with that. Um, also, it's just so easy to get that uh, when you're trying to just make your own stuff really quickly, corn syrup and a little bit of food coloring. But there's a whole bunch of other additives that kind of do different things, thicken it and make it uh, more and less washable. And then, you know, I could also talk for an hour about washability <laughs> and, and different fabrics. So maybe that'll be one for another year. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jen. I'm going to turn yeah, it back over to Jen. All. Thanks, everybody, for coming. This is wonderful. You give me a good way to spend my Sunday night. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie, and thanks so much, Jen, for a really thorough, clear, informative, and fun presentation. This is stuff we can all use, I'm sure. All right, folks, grab your Sharpies and mark your calendars. It is coming attractions time. Next up on Spaminar on Sunday, November 22nd, Spam member Ben Homan, Properties Director of Utah Shakespeare Festival, will be discussing and demonstrating Prop Textures 101, demonstrations of using common, affordable items to elevate your props to the next level. Closing out 2020 on Sunday, December 20th, will be SPAM member and Penn State University Prop Supervisor and Instructor Jay Lasnick. Jay's been building props since his sophomore year in high school and will be presenting I Eat Glue, 35 years of Jay's prop and costume craft portfolio. Looking into next year, and we do believe there will be one, on January 17th, 2021, that's three days before Inauguration Day, by the way, our presenter will be SPAM member Larry Heyman, Associate Professor of Properties Design and Fabrication, and lecturer in Theater Design and Production at the Oklahoma City University School of Theater. Larry's a veteran of TV and film prop work and will talk to us about prop adjacent careers in film, television, and related trades. You can find us on Facebook at Props for the Stage and Beyond, powered by SPAM. 
And with any luck at all, next year you'll see us at the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festivals. And be sure to drop by online at the all virtual 2021 USITT conference. Spaminar is produced by the Society of Property Artists and Managers with special thanks to the SPAM Education, Publicity, and Finance Committees. Thanks again for watching. Now go wash your damn hands, put on your masks, vote, and prop on.